All right, let's get straight to it. Today, our focus is cerebral venous thrombosis, or CVT. Right, and this is a diagnosis that can cause some real, yeah, well, some real diagnostic and management headaches, mainly because it's so rare. It truly is. While CVT only accounts for a tiny fraction of all strokes, what is it, about 0.5 to 1%? That's right, but it demands immediate differentiation from arterial events. Let's establish the core pathology first because that really dictates everything that follows. Okay. If we assume our audience knows what a clot is, what's the fundamental difference here? How is CBT different from a standard ischemic stroke? The core difference is the plumbing, you could say. In CDT, you have a blood clot in the dural venous sinuses or the cerebral veins themselves. So it's an outflow problem. It's an outflow problem. It obstructs cerebral blood drainage. The immediate and uh, most dangerous consequence is venous infarction and often rapidly rising intracranial hypertension. That pressure buildup explains a lot of the variable presentation we see. Given its rarity, what's the incidence rate we should be aware of and who is the primary target? The key demographic differentiator is age. CVT predominantly targets young adults, unlike typical arterial strokes. And the incidence is rising, isn't it? It is, yes. We've seen the reported incidence rise, most likely due to improved imaging sensitivity. The current figures are somewhere around 1.32 to 1.57 per 100,000 person years. That's important context. What about the sex breakdown? Is it equitable? Oh, far from it. The female to male ratio is starkly skewed. How skewed? About three to one. And this connects directly back to the most common transient risk factors. Which leads us perfectly into etiology. We need to screen for those three categories of risk factors, transient, permanent, and emerging. What's the highest yield on the transient side? The highest yield is um, anything tied to hypercoagulability in young women. So pregnancy and the immediate puerperium period, and of course, oral contraceptive use. That's a major one. A major one. We also can't forget temporary inflammatory drivers, uh -huh. like local infection, sinusitis, or otitis, or even just dehydration. Okay, so once we stabilize the acute event, we shift gears to the underlying predisposition. What permanent factors are non-negotiable for long-term screening? This is where you look for inherited or acquired thrombophilias. I mean, the congenital or chronic conditions. It's like factor V Leiden. Exactly. Deficiencies in protein C or protein S or the factor V Leiden mutation. Beyond those, systemic diseases like malignancy, hematologic disorders, and severe autoimmune conditions like lupus are high-risk permanent factors. And that screening is essential for prognosis. Now let's talk about the category that has become unavoidable in the last few years. The emerging associations. The primary emerging association is, of course, SARS-CoV-2 infection itself. However, the one that creates an immediate life or death management challenge is that rare complication. Associated with the adenoviral vector-based COVID-19 vaccines. Correct. You're talking about vaccine-induced immune-mediated thrombotic thrombocytopenia, VITT. Why is recognizing this so important? The ITT is a distinct immune-mediated pathology. The patient's own antibodies cause thrombosis with thrombocytopenia. If you treat this with standard heparin, you risk clinical catastrophe. Which is a huge setup for our treatment discussion later. But first, the signs. What clinical presentations should alert us to potential CVT? It is highly variable, but four major syndromes tend to emerge. A severe headache from intracranial hypertension, seizures, focal neurological deficits, and altered mental status. How common is that headache presentation? Give us the figure that should worry every clinician. Intracranial hypertension is almost universal. Headache is present in a staggering 87 to 90 percent of cases. Wow. Yeah, and that high rate of a non-specific headache is why this diagnosis can get missed. Seizures occur in about 24 to 44 percent of cases, and profound encephalopathy or even coma in 13 to 22 percent. And the clot's location gives us clues, right? Can you connect the anatomical patterns to specific deficits? Absolutely. Just think about the drainage area. If the clot involves the superior sagittal sinus, the SSS, it often causes bilateral signs. So bilateral motor deficits. Bilateral motor deficits and frequent seizures, yes. But if the clot is in the deep venous system, well, that's where you see severe deep-seated symptoms like bihemispheric thalamic lesions or profound amnesia. That's the needle in the haystack. So if we suspect this, we need rapid confirmation. What's the gold standard for a definitive diagnosis? It all relies on imaging. The gold standard is magnetic resonance imaging coupled with magnetic resonance venography, so MRI with MRV. And what are we looking for on the MRV? 
We're looking for the direct signs of the thrombus, the loss of the normal flow void, which is usually present in patent vessels. We also look for direct visualization of the clot and restriction on diffusion-weighted imaging, or DWI. MRI takes time, though. What's the rapid imaging modality that's more widely available? That would be computed tomography with CT venography. CT with CTV, it's fast and it's accessible. What are the classic signs on that CT? On the non-contrast CT, you might spot the hyperdense cord sign if a cortical vein is cladded. But the definitive sign of the venography is the delta sign. Right, the triangle? The triangular filling defect, yes. Most commonly seen in the superior sagittal sinus, where the contrast-enhanced dura surrounds the unenhanced thrombus. Let's talk labs. How useful is D-dimer testing here? Well, D-dimer is sensitive, meaning a normal D-dimer may help rule it out, especially in low-risk scenarios, but it is notoriously nonspecific. Especially in these patient populations. Exactly. In patients who are already hypercoagulable, like pregnant or post-surgical patients, it tells you something is clotting, but not where. It has to be supported by full coagulation panels and eventually a thrombophilia screen. The major challenge is ruling out conditions that mimic that severe headache and focal deficit. We have to distinguish CVT from at least four key differentials. All right. First, arterial stroke. That's a sudden onset, and you'll see clear vascular stenosis on MRA. Second, reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome, which often has a classic thunderclap headache. And what about the two that involve posterior brain edema? So there's posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome, or PRES, that's strongly associated with acute hypertension and classically shows posterior vasogenic edema. And then suprachnoid hemorrhage, which shows blood in the sulci and ventricles on CT. Okay, let's transition to management. Once CVT is confirmed, what's the immediate first-line treatment? And is this still the case even if the patient has a bleed? Acute anticoagulation is the standard. Low molecular weight heparin, LMWH, or unfractionated heparin, is the first-line therapy. And yes, absolutely, it must be initiated, even if imaging shows hemorrhagic infarction. Why not delay it? That seems counterintuitive. Because the pathophysiology is obstruction. The hemorrhagic conversion is often secondary to that venous hypertension. The benefit of preventing the clot from extending and promoting reperfusion outweighs the risk of secondary bleeding. So anticoagulation, despite hemorrhage, is a clinical mandate for CVT. It is. Which heparin agent is preferred, and what's the standard dosing? LMWH is generally preferred for its predictability. A standard approach is enoxaparin, dosed at 1 mg per kilogram subcutaneously every 12 hours. And once stabilized, what's the long-term anticoagulation strategy? What are the duration targets? Long-term, we transition to warfarin, targeting an INR between 2.0 and 3.0. The duration depends entirely on the etiology. For provoked cases, three to six months is generally sufficient. And for unprovoked? For unprovoked CVT or in high-risk thrombophilias, the duration shifts to longer, potentially indefinite therapy. Direct oral anticoagulants, the DOACs, are everywhere now. Are they replacing warfarin in CVT management? They're increasingly used, yes. Studies show they have similar efficacy and safety profiles compared to warfarin, and, you know, they offer great convenience. They're technically off-label, but their adoption is growing fast. Now for intervention. When should endovascular therapy, thrombolysis, or thrombectomy even be on the table? Endovascular therapy is strictly reserved. This is a key insight. It's only for severe, rapidly deteriorating cases that fail to improve despite optimal medical anticoagulation. So why the strict reservation? Is the evidence weak? The evidence is limited. The landmark 2020 randomized control trial, the TOACT study, showed no significant functional benefit for endovascular therapy over medical anticoagulation alone. So the message is clear. The message is clear. Uh -huh. Unless the patient is crashing despite adequate heparin, you stick to medical management. It's a massive point for intervention decisions. Finally, let's go back to that specific management challenge, VITT. We said you must avoid heparin. What is the alternative protocol? You must immediately transition to non-heparin anticoagulants. This is mandatory. Agents like Argotroban or Fondaparinex are used instead. That's not all, is it? No. This treatment has to be combined with high-dose intravenous immunoglobulin and corticosteroids to address the underlying immune-mediated component. Missing that means missing the actual cause. That's the distinction every emergency physician and neurologist must know. So finally, what's the typical prognosis we can communicate to patients? The prognosis is actually surprisingly good, provided there's early diagnosis and intervention. Approximately 80% of patients achieve good functional outcomes. Overall mortality is low, around 5 to 10%. But I imagine that figure changes if treatment is delayed. It does. 
Mortality can climb to 34% in severe untreated cases. The recurrence risk is modest, about 5 to 10%, which just reinforces the need for that long-term anticoagulation strategy. This has been a focused extraction of the most high-value clinical information on CVT. We've covered differentiation, imaging, and the non-negotiable management protocols. And remember that VITT distinction is paramount. The TOACT data gives us the mandate for medical management first line, but VITT demands a full protocol deviation swamping to non-heparin agents and adding immune modulation. So what does this all mean for you as you return to your clinical practice? Well, this raises an important question. Given that an extremely high percentage of patients present only with headache, up to 90%, how can we refine low-yield imaging strategies to capture these rare but time-sensitive diagnoses more efficiently. That's the real challenge.